Hello, um, good evening everyone. Um, my name is Joe Chris and I'm from the Festival of Debate. Uh, for those of you who might not have come across the Festival of Debate before, we're based uh, in Sheffield in the UK and we run a number of in-person events here in Sheffield, but we also have a wide-ranging online programme uh, that involves both local, regional and national activists and campaigners and uh, yes and, and the object of the whole festival really is to bring people together to discuss the key social, economic, political environment, historical issues of the day, all of the issues and you know what we're really interested in and focus on is also finding um, solutions um, to, to some of these issues and, and some of these problems. Um, just before we begin just going to do a few uh, sort of brief housekeeping um, things. So um, at the Festival of Debate, we aim to create a, a safer festival where we care and look out for each other. We're committed to providing an environment that's welcoming, accessible and inclusive for all attendees and for all our team members and volunteers. Um, in, in light of that, we've got the, the Q&A box tonight where you will be able to ask questions for our attendees but we'd just like to ask people to be respectful and be kind and, and be inclusive as, as possible you, you, if you're using that Q&A box and you won't be able to ask any anonymous uh, questions in, in the Q&A box um, today. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce our chair for tonight's event um, could you please welcome Evie Muir. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone, and um, welcome to Change From Within, um, an examination of the racial justice movement within the violence against women and girls sector. And as I welcome everyone to joining us on this fine Wednesday evening for what promises to be an enthralling and mobilizing discussion, um, I just want to kind of do a bit of an introduction um, first to myself and to um, how we came to be here tonight. Um, so my name's Evie, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm a domestic abuse survivor and specialist specialising in the intersections of racialized and gendered trauma, in particular black queer experiences of domestic abuse. I'm also a freelance journalist and the founder of Peaks of Colour, a Peak District based walking club by and for people of colour only. Having worked in the violence against women and girls sector in Sheffield and South Yorkshire for almost 10 years, working with services who are committed to embedding anti racism and LGBT inclusion into their practice, I've witnessed and experienced the ways that domestic abuse survivors with intersecting identities experience intersecting oppressions at both the hands of our intimate partners and the services that are designed to support us. My experience is that while the sector preaches trauma-informed practice, it only practices this through the lens of white cisgender women's trauma and doesn't account for, for example, the trauma of white supremacy and white women's role in upholding this. Having experienced and witnessed so much racism, homophobia and transphobia and wider bias, at both the individual and institutional levels, I've been left wondering if the sector is safe for me, a black queer survivor, to work in. The conclusion I've come to is that it's not. And at the moment, I'm really interested in the ways that alternative forms of justice and healing can be found for survivors and what role the Vogue sector plays in this. It's for these reasons that I wouldn't hesitate to say that the Vogue sector is institutionally racist. And I also wouldn't hesitate to say that the Vogue sector is violent. This may come as a surprise to some people. After all, how can the violence against women and girls sector, a sector designed to combat violence, also be a perpetrator of it? Well, for those who read the promo for this event, you'll know we described it as a uncomfortable but necessary conversation to inspire revolutionary change. And it's these truths we're hoping to raise today through the lens of racism and racial justice. 
So often mainstream conversations on eradicating gendered violence get stuck in the cycle of what can men do? And this almost always centers white women's experiences. This only allows us to focus on one piece of the puzzle. Meanwhile, by and for grassroots organizations, and by that, I mean, for example, by black survivors for black survivors, or by queer survivors for queer survivors, are maintaining a legacy of working on the ground with communities, mobilizing on the front lines with little funding and little support. We'll never eradicate gendered violence whilst our knowledge and expertise is pushed to the margins by those with power and privilege within the movement. So tonight is about recentering by and for expertise. And tonight we'll be answering questions such as, what are the intersecting oppressions experienced by black and minoritized survivors within the context of gendered violence? How is institutional racism and wider bias perpetrated and upheld by the services supposed to offer support and justice? In what ways can black feminist frameworks curate a landscape for intersectionality, abolition and decolonization? And why is the activism of by and for grassroots movements so integral to creating transformative change? So on that note, I'll stop my ramblings and open the floor up to our panelists to introduce themselves. Joining me in this transformative conversation is a panel of experts whose activism is a place of safety and a source of continual inspiration for me and my own advocacy. Um, I'm not much of a celebrity follower, um, but if I were to fangirl anyone, it would probably be those I'm sharing this space with tonight. So lovely panel, if you wouldn't mind, could you share with us your name, your pronouns, if you feel comfortable and a bit about your organization and the work you do. Um, I'll start with the first person who I can see on my screen and that is Huda. Sorry, my laptop is a bit slow. <laughs> So I pressed. <laughs> anyway, um, hello everyone. I am delighted to be here today. Um, I am really honoured to um, hold community in this space. My name is Huda Jawad. Uh, my pronouns are she, um, her, and I um, kind of I've I've primarily here in this space as a, a representative of the anti-racism working group for the violence against women and girls sector. Um, and we are a group that convened uh, from within the sector to address the systemic uh, um, racism uh, in the, the VORG sector in the UK. Um, our reach is primarily England, although we have uh, um, uh, women, uh, black and minoritized women, we, you know, contacting us from Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, my day job is I am the co-director of a global international feminist Muslim organization called Musawa, and we work on empowering and furthering the rights of Muslim women in Muslim majority contexts. Um, and I have worked in um, the uh, Vogue movement sector um, for the last 11 years, and I also co-founded the um, Faith and Vogue uh, Coalition. Thank you so much, Huda. Um, Riddle, I can see you next. Hi, um, thank you for having me uh, here. It's it's great to be here with, with everybody. Um, so I am the CEO of Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre, and uh, which is based in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, I'm the only sort of brown migrant woman, a trans woman, uh, who is the CEO of a rape crisis centre in Scotland. So none of those sort of intersectional identities are represented even in sort of single, uh, as single protected characteristics in any of the other centres uh, in Scotland. Um, I've worked in the VOG sector in Scotland since 2004, most of that time at uh, uh, Shakti Women's Aid, and then later on at Rape Crisis Scotland on the National Helpline uh, for Scotland. And before my current role at Edinburgh Rape Crisis, I used to manage a smaller Rape Crisis Centre called Fourth Valley, and I'm often the only sort of brown woman in most of the spaces that I, I go to. Um, 
and I will only do this at the moment. I used to be on a number of boards before, but not anymore. Thank you so much, Riddle. And I think we can all probably uh, relate to the feeling of being the only woman in uh, these rooms for a big part of our careers. Um, so thank you for being here today. Um, Rose, I can see you next. Hi, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosa Lewis. I am um, an IDVA, Independent Domestic Violence Advisor, and um, part of management of Sister Space. Sister Space is um, a charity organization working with uh, African heritage women, uh, black women, um, African, Caribbean, Australia, no matter where you are, no matter where you come from, as long as you're a black woman. And, um, but we also help out any woman that's going through any type of abuse, but our specialism is black women. Um, as I'll talk about later, um, there are, you know, there are particular things, very important particular things, um, which is why it's important for us to talk and uh, talk about um, and making, um, you know, the, like the campaigning and um, making our voices heard. So I'm really looking forward to to talking, <laughs> which I, which I do a lot of. <laughs> so. We love hearing you talk. Thank um, you. And I'm so glad, so glad you're here. And um, Avia. I know you're out and about at the minute. Have you been working on the front lines? Um, but yeah, could you introduce yourself, please? Hey, um, I'm Avia. My pronouns are she, her. I am currently just on the side of Hattie Town Hall, uh, which is a place that me and Rose have spent many, many times fighting justice. All roads seem to come back to Hattie Town Hall somehow. Um, but anyway, the, like the reason why I'm here is because uh, yeah, there was a um, immigration raid resistance by delivery drivers a couple of weeks ago, and they are mobilising. Like it was amazing, 500 people turned out to resist and and managed, and it was successful. And they're mobilising, and um, yeah, I've been doing bits to support them basically. Um, so I'm kind of like doing doing two things at once at the moment, which is a lot, but here we are. Um, but yeah, I've, I'm part of Sisters Uncut, which is a national uh, collective fighting cuts of domestic violence services as well as state violence. And um, more recently, Sisters Uncut have been involved in supporting the setting up of cop watch groups um, as part of that kind of resisting state violence and kind of that intersectional kind of understanding of our struggles um, branching out into, yeah, abolitionist organising on the ground, which is, you know, kind of why I'm here as well to support the to support the um, those uh, resisting immigration. I think it's really really important that we do connect these struggles. Uh, it's one of the things that the the mainstream fog sector is shit at, <laughs> to be honest, um, is actually understanding that. You know, we can't be in competition with each other. We can't be competing with each other. There is no liberation unless we bring all of us. And so, you know, if we're fighting like to resist patriarchal violence and abuse, we've also got to link that with immigration controls, immigration enforcement, um, the oppression by police. It is all deeply connected. There's no, there's no like chopping us like these little bits of the movement up and and getting freedom for one but not the other so yeah i kind of you know thought might as well connect connect the dots there as much as i can because uh, i think that's really important i agree it's very important and i think what a way to start and um, really diving into exactly the reasons why we're here and um, and i think very poignant that you know on the front lines as we speak um, i know riddle said that uh, kids might be popping in as we talk and it's just to say that as women of colour working within the sector we are navigating the, both the, prof uh, the professional and the personal and um, our jobs look 
like many different forms. So we're really meeting each other where we're at quite literally tonight. I think that's quite important that we're showcasing that. Um, but I'm gonna dive straight in to the questions because I've got many. Um, and my first one is to Rose, if it's okay for me to start with you. Um, and you mentioned the work of Sister Space and your campaigns. Um, and I really wanna to touch on that in the first instance because the work of Sister Space and the overwhelming success of your campaigns, in particular, the Valerie's Law campaign, which amassed over 100,000 signatures, qualifying it to be considered in the House of Lords, has raised nationwide awareness of the ways that African Caribbean survivors experience domestic abuse and sexual violence. So I wonder, for those who might be unaware, could you introduce us to the ways that Black survivors um, experience harm at the hands of both our intimate partners, our family and loved ones, and the services that are supposedly designed to support us, um, and how Valerie's Law is hoping to, to change that. Okay, that's, that's three questions. Yes. <laughs> you will have to, yeah, let's be real here, yeah, you will have to lower it. Right, <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm going. Um, so about uh, Black women, um being harmed in domestic abuse we've got to one of the first things we've got to um remember is that and we all know this most the majority of people women and people going through domestic abuse don't know they're going through domestic abuse and the voir sector and other people have particular names for it and in different communities those are and may not be the names that they're going to use domestic abuse most people know it as domestic violence and when you tell them uh domestic abuse and you know they, they'll tell you they're going through they'll uh, survivors tell you what they're going through you know they'll tell you it's financial it keeps taking my money or the family keeps taking my money they'll tell you it's emotional they, they will tell you but they don't see it in the same way that the the blog sector may well see it um Culturally, there are a lot of barriers culturally. There are a lot of, um, so for example, we know in African Caribbean um, community, you don't tell your business to anybody. Don't tell your business to people. Um, you, you know, you'll sort it out. You'll sort it out maybe through the church with your pastor, your priest or whomever it is. Religion plays a, a, a big part. Um, you can't say nothing because you may not be, you may not have your papers. If you don't have your papers, immigration, it has a big part to play in it. If you do tell people about what you're going through, there's the shame, there's community ostracized, uh, is it where you be, get ostracized for your community and your family? And it can be very, very, very harsh. And um, as we know, blame is always put on, on the person. Then you've got the whole kind of um, patriarchy thing in, in a lot of the countries that you come from. Um, you know, stay with him. People will tell you, stay with him. Feed him properly. Look after him properly. Do this, do that and everything and it then you know it, like it becomes your fault and he gets no blame in it you know he works hard he's going through a hard time the family's like this and the closing up of um of of the family especially with the, you know like family abuse also um and and the, the the whole thing is always about don't tell people your business but then you've got all the other stuff that goes with it language barriers, language issues. You have the history uh, of black people and the all the services, every single service you can think of, we have a history with them. We have a history with the police. A lot of women will not report their husbands, their sons, their fathers, or whomever is doing abuse because of the, the, the relationship and the history with the police. You want abuse to stop, but you don't want the police to come 
and it's possible that your son, uncle, father, whomever it is, can get killed by the police. Lot so many black deaths in custody for with black men. So there's you know there's there's all of that. Um, we have a history with social services, all the way back to from the 60s onwards. We have a history of the social services. They're just taking your child. So you're frightened to report because the first thing they, they're gonna say, you're a single mother. Remember the stereotypes that we as black women get is just off the scale. You're a single mother. You've got a lot of children. Some people have the audacity to tell the women that you've got um, lots of children by different fathers. The audacity to bring that in. Um, and don't forget the women are already going for a lot of guilt. As you all know, we have the whole thing with the NHS, although the majority of, uh, well, a, a huge um, percentage of uh, black men and women, but we're talking about black women work in the NHS. Um, our, our relationship with the NHS as patients and everything, mental health, um, even in terms of maternity, and everything, there's a history there also. And also with the education system, I could go on and on about all that, but those are the main, those are the main services who really are not friendly with, um, with, with black women, African heritage people, women going through um, domestic abuse. That was the first one. What was the second one you said? The second one was um, Valerie's law. And what is it and how is it trying to combat these issues that you've just spoken of? Yeah, so Valerie's Law, um, for those of you who may not know, just very briefly, Valerie, um, a, a, a woman community, uh, she worked in, um, in the community and she was actually helping women going through domestic abuse. She was murdered, tragically murdered. She and her 23-month-old her daughter, um, Real Jazeera, they were murdered by... Um, by Valerie's ex-partner. He murdered both Valerie and the baby. Um, there were a lot of mistakes that were made. The, um, the, the review that, that was written um, showed all the steps that should have been taken and all the mistakes that were made. Now we decided, you know, we, we find all the time there are just so many basic mistakes that are made. And part of the reason why those basic mistakes are made is that people think that they know black women, they know what we want, what we need, and they continuously talk um, for us, about us, but really don't really know anything. So one of the things that we said it was, um, we went for this Valerie's Law, and Valerie's Law is just about all professionals who deal with African heritage women going through domestic abuse to have basic training and awareness about, about us. Those training should, has to be delivered by us, not by, it can't be delivered by, by another culture because we wouldn't be able to uh, be expertise in somebody else's culture. And this is what it is. Um, so we petitioned and we had to get that 100,000. Um, and all we're asking is, take the training, police, take the training, and you will, you will know A, B, C, X, Y, Z, how to go about it. You know, as I spoke about earlier, about language, about the stereotypes, I did not mention the word racism, but that is in big capital letters. And this is what um, Valerie's Law's training is about. The, the training that we have done with organizations, including the VOIG, Violence Against Women and Girls sector, really proves that we, it is essential that we have this training because even, um, um, even the IDVAs, some of the IDVAs that we've, we've trained, some of the IDVAs that we work with, some of the IDVAs that we, that we speak to and you, know, you try to get help, some of their, their thought patterns and some of the things that they come out with, with is horrendous and it really sets back um, the work that everyone is trying to do in, in, all, in all sectors. And so that's why Valerie's Law is very important. 
Thank you for, for the introduction to that. And I think what came out of that for me, um, as, as well as with the um, with the things that Avia was talking about as well, was that issue of intersectionality and the ways that we experience um, abuse in multiple forms from multiple arenas. Uh, you mentioned the community, you mentioned in regards to immigration um, and different systems, education, health, policing. Um, having an intersectional understanding of the ways we ex experience abuse is key. And that leads me quite nicely onto my next question, which is for Middle. Um, because I'm wondering if on the back of that, you could share how um, these harms are perpetrated intersectionally in more detail. In particular, I'm wondering about how the Borg sector perpetrates and upholds these oppressions from within. Um, for example, where do you see power imbalances enforced against staff and practitioners um, and the advocates who stand up against those power structures within the sector um, and who are advocating for the survivors who, who Rose mentioned? So, I mean, I can reflect on Scotland and, you know, um, like we have a much smaller community of of, of people of color um, as well as migrants, but but I think there are similarities across the UK, um, and we have a smaller sector as well. Um, so for me, in terms of intersectionality and intersectional thinking, that simply isn't really in there in practice, unless you have someone who is so committed to intersectional practice as a leader. And they are few and far between uh, in terms of the practice. I think in terms of commitment and the sort of making the noises, we are in a much better place than we were before. So at least uh, what, what I find, so, you know, I've said the bar really low, I at least find people willing to talk about and engage with this idea of intersectionality. Um, more so within the movement that I work in, the rape crisis movement, and I don't see that much of it in within domestic abuse services. Um, what happens to those of us who are looking to stand up for survivors, uh, particularly those from minority ethnic backgrounds or others who have intersectional identities, is that we are not only tackling a system that is that is built on prejudice external to our organizations, but even as you said in your opening, uh, the sort of the structures within these organizations that were set up for white women by white women is, is a lot of burnout, a lot of frustration, or you just own it all. And the change, if you make any positive changes within those organizations, they sort of die when you move on. Uh, so very little systemic change is happening. So there's an over-reliance uh, amongst these services to refer to the nearest uh, organization for run by women of color. Whether that organization is appropriate or not, or whether they have the same ethos, at least the stated ethos on violence against women and girls or not. So if you go outside of the sort of central belt of Scotland um, into more rural and island communities, uh, the reliance on, on groups of small community groups to seek advice on issues that those groups would probably not be appropriate for and not really even questioning whether this is the group that we should be going to so you know going to a like just a community group a social group of let's say uh south asian women um and suddenly uh you know a women's organization domestic abuse, a refuge or whoever, women's aid might phone them and say, well, we have this woman, can you support her without making any inquiry into the safety um, for the women in that group or the survivor herself? So we see a lot of all of that happening. Um, and if you are not, and, and, and again, there is a difference. So I'm just reflecting on my own service where I work just now. Um, so this, ser this, this service has a long-standing project uh, that was um, 
set up specifically for minority ethnic women. And even within the setup, you know, it was led by a woman of color. Uh, so it has all the right things before I, I got there. But the expertise, uh, again, that I found was the expertise existed when it came to um, immigrant women. And that so the outreach was, was purely with immigrant women of color. But then we never saw until I got there, we hardly had done any work with second, third generation women of color uh, around sexual violence. And when we did get a, and it was only uncovered when we got a situation um, where uh, there was there were these young women who had grown up in Scotland and their experience of sexual violence and their risks, they look so different, but that expertise wasn't there, but also like the investment in, in thinking about the differences within our communities as, as well, that's often missing. So with all the best intentions, we still had so much that was missing. And that led to some really sort of dangerous uh, risks uh, for the women that were being supported. And it just happened that, you know, I happened to start working there and I happened to ask those questions because that case was somehow told, you know, like as a CEO, you don't hear about all the cases. So in passing, someone told me about it. And then I had to think about, well, have you thought about all of these things? So I think, um, even where attempts are made to be intersectional or being be inclusive, um, I I feel like the complexity of of the lives of women of color and those intersecting oppressions as well as intersecting identities that really isn't there where attempts are being made to provide appropriate service within sort of white mainstream organizations like my organization I may be the CEO but you know it has a for almost 44 year history of of whiteness and one you know leader within a year is not going to change that and actually what I also know is that um, if I were to leave uh, it is vulnerable to falling back into patterns of of whiteness and centering whiteness and, and thinking. So for me, it's very much about like, how do you build the structures that make it impossible or near difficult to fall back on whiteness? So it's almost like you have to destroy something. And, you know, it's like the dance of Shiva. That's how I see it, the, the Tandava, which is the, the act of destruction to, to, to make something be reborn. Um, and, it's something that I've had to learn because it, it's a very lonely space in Scotland when um, you find yourself as a woman of color in a largely white organization that has this long history of decision-making of building structures that cater mostly not just to white women, but actually have catered mainly to, interestingly, to middle-class women uh, in our service provision because of the demand being so high, uh, you could only respond to those who found you rather than you going out and being able to find those who are not coming to you. So all of that. I hope I answered your question. I feel like I lost myself somewhere. <laughs> no, but it was it was answered beautifully. And I think um so much in what you said resonated with my own experiences as both survivor and practitioner um in relation to the burnout and the frustration um and kind of that expertise being lost when when these roles go. Um, and you mentioned about the um how there's very little systemic change and I think that's something that that I feel and that I've seen um, and it's also something that I know Hud has uh, seen because with the anti-racism working group within the blog sector um, that is essentially designed to challenge just that um, and these things really aren't discussed enough are they the ways that it's not just racist individuals who perpetrate these harms um, at an individual level but it's also the wider racist structures that uphold and consolidate them at a systemic level um, so I was wondering Huda if you could speak on some of those really overlooked elements at the um, systemic level I know um, in your trainings and in your sessions uh, there's talks on the ways that funding and resource allocations um, uphold these racist structures. 
Um, so I wonder if you could um, touch on some of these things and elaborate on these harms and how the Charter and the Feministo um, are really hoping to challenge that. Great, yes, I'm very happy to. I think, um, yes, it's uh, really uh, my, what I have to say really kind of um, uh, supports um, uh, what Mira said in terms of, uh, you know, the, we recognize both the Feminista and the Anti-Racist Charter recognize that um, we live in a racist structure and we exist in a kind of, capitalist neoliberal um, state of existence, not just a physical um, uh, state, but also one that uh, replicates the harms that the wider context that we live in um, uh, uh, kind of uh, does to the, the to all of us. So the the the, the violence against women and girls sector is definitely not a safe space uh, for many of us uh, uh, and uh, racism and, and prejudice is uh, is built into its very DNA uh, and so one of the things that the feministo and the charter try to do is is explain the ways in which this um, uh, these structures are continually perpetrating harm um, and reinforcing white supremacy um uh in 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 the sector but also um it, it it enables the white supremacy the harm and the racism of wider society um and because we live in a capitalist society this idea of resource is kind of one of the foundations upon which the society that we exist in um kind of rests upon and this idea that black and minoritized people um, and then further down the ladder, black and minoritized women are, um, are purposefully uh, not enabled to have access to resources in the same way um, uh, as white men and white women. Um, and I think one of the things that we really um, point out to both the feminista does that and uh, and the I will call it the arc the anti-racism charter but it gives it this kind of biblical kind of superpower I'm hoping um, in the sense that it they both recognize that uh, not only do black and monetized women not have access to the same resources but the disparity um, in which uh, this this uh, this exists it makes it kind of unachievable that there will ever be parity and equality and it also the the way in which we get the money is also ensures that we never get it um and so the 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 system that you know i think in imkan's um report uh, several years ago it highlights that um, the whole uh, black and minoritized um, women's by and for sector in England and Wales, their, their, their entirety uh, and budget capacity of all these organizations in England and Wales is equal to the same as 10 white led organizations in London. Now, that, if that doesn't tell you something is seriously wrong, then I don't know what will. So, not, so uh, that, that's one. The other is that the model by which we get the money has become so much about what is the cheapest you can give us for our pound, as opposed to what is the quality and the transformation of the support that you give to the women. Um, and so in, in doing that, because uh, buy and for services are so small and, uh, and um, lacking of resource, they don't, have, uh, they don't have the structure to go for a bid because there's no more money to cut this because there's no money to start off with. Do you know what I mean? And so the white led organizations have this kind of economies of scale model where if I shave up from there, I, you know, I, I will use that fund and uh, account it this way, enables them to kind of even entertain the idea of a tender. 
Whereas for black and uh, minoritized organizations and by and for services, that's just not because the, the CEO is also the lawyer, the helpline manager, the worker, the social worker, the case worker, the advocate, the accountant and the fundraiser. So there's, there's no more, nothing to cut anymore. Um, and, for, and finally, the, this, uh, well, not finally, but also um, what, what the, the kind of tendering uh, system means is that, uh, uh, and assumes is that women's specialist organizations are services, they are transactions. You come here, you get this, we pay you this much for doing that for this particular time, and this is the outcome that we want. That is fine if you live in a factory, but these are women and human beings that have been through multiple traumas. Both the speakers have outlined the, like, the layered trauma that these women go through in order, and if they're lucky enough to access their services. Um, and, and that kind of expertise cannot be found in generic services that are well-resourced, let alone specialist women's services that are white-led. And so what that means is no one has the capacity to do the specialist work uh, and rebuilding uh, and uh, recovery um, apart from the women who are the survivors who've gone through that process and who have set up these organizations by survivors for survivors. Um, but they're the most um, kind of marginalized economically and less resourced. Um, and so when you and when women go to buy and for services, they're not just there to provide a three month kind of casework support. They also do education. They do family therapy. They do support for the children. They do trauma informed care. They fight immigration. You know, they they fight housing. Not that I'm not saying that you know, uh, white-led organizations don't do these things, but white-led organizations can get money for this bit of the work in a way that black and minoritized and buy and for services cannot, because then they are deemed as exclusive and not inclusive of all women. Even though organizations like Sister Space provide, see any woman who walks through the door, all women's organizations, whether buy and for or not, see any woman who says, I want help. Um, but the, the, the so-called philanthropy and funding landscape, it enables this kind of very uh, funneled, uh, privileged level of funding that really works for the funder and nobody else. It certainly doesn't work for the women that need the help. Um, and so one of the things that we, we, we kind of firmly believe at the ARC and in the Feminista that plays out is that if you don't fund a, a buy and for service or, or an organization, you're not just removing a, a service from access, you're actually um, d uh, removing a whole community asset. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a space where communities get together for things other than just trauma of, of violence, that gendered violence. It is a space of, um, safety of community of solidarity of um, coming together you know many buy and for organizations run food banks they advocate for children who are impacted by racist schools uh, practices by housing all of that stuff and you know if that if that was done in a white led organization it will have you know a budget of two million pounds at least but these organizations survive on less than 20,000 a year. And so when you, uh, one of the things that we're very clear about in, in, in the anti-racism charter is calling that out and saying it very clearly. And so the added layer of complexity comes when white led organizations do two things. They appropriate the work and create a project for black and minoritized women or or oh, and on top of that, they go into partnerships with buy and for services out of the goodness of their own hearts, because you know uh, it looks good to the funder that we're doing a kind of a partnership bid, 
And we can tick the box of equalities and diversity because we're getting, um, you know, the, 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 the logo of a particular organization of buy and for organization to do the work. Uh, and, he, and I, I'm not saying buy-in for organizations don't know this. They know this inside out, but it's become a survival strategy. And, and so the, the, the gain is never immediate. It's always with the hope of long-term. Well, if I get this, if I go into this funding with this organization, maybe I will have a track record of funding and therefore future funders will feel that I am fit for purpose to spend their money that they got from pillaging our community anyway. Um, and also um, it, 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 it's about kind of the possibility of extended funding, et cetera, et cetera. So appropriation becomes real in the sense that, um, you know, we would, uh, a, a white led service might uh, do an FGM project it has no knowledge, it has no cultural literacy, it has no literacy of the trauma and the experiences of these women, the community experience um, of what it's like, um, as, uh, um, as Rose said, you know, women are harmed by the men, but they have a duty to protect the men, because if they say anything against the men, the men are dead. And the men may be also perpetrators, but they're also the providers. They're also the, the husbands and the brothers and the lovers of these and the partners and the, the priests and the community leaders and the interlocutors to that harmful space that is called wider white society. So we are silenced, you know, black and minoritized women are silenced. And these organizations that, that come, that are built by us, for us, know this inside out. It's built into our kind of, you know, our bones. So we, we have found very creative and um, uh, uh, compassionate ways of dealing with that. And for white-led organizations, it's like a blunt instrument. It destroys anything in its path. Um, and so appropriating a service like that, and so the, so the funder or the local authority, which where most of the money comes from, or increasingly less now, um, will say, well, um, so-and-so are providing that service, so you don't need to be funded, thank you very much. And anyway, they can see more women for the pound um, and they will see more people, so, and it's more inclusive. So I think, I think th these are something, these are the kind of manifestations of racism in our sector and harm that we at the Anti-Racism Working Group do not mince our words around and require accountability for. Um, and the Feministo, it supports that because the Feministo came about because increasingly after the, 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 um, the, the presentation of the Anti-Racism Charter to white-led organizations, white organizations started saying, yes, yes, we believe in this, but we, we're going to tweak it a little bit to suit us and our context. And the, uh, the, there was, you know, white, uh, black and minoritized women in the sector felt, you're now whitewashing our anti-racism charter, that's not going to happen. And so the feministo came to say, it, as black and minoritized women in the sector, the only anti-racism work that we recognize as authentic and rooted in racial justice is the anti-racism charter. So you can have your equality and diversity and inclusion officer, you can have your policy, but if it doesn't adopt the anti-racism charter, then it's not something that we recognize as truly intersectional or anti-racist. Um, so I think I've harped on about, you're making me angry, so I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> But yes, that's <laughs> it's, a, it's a very infuriating topic, let's be honest. And I mean, I noticed we were all nodding emphatically all the way through that. Um, and there was so much in what you said that really resonated. I think that statistic um, early on is damning. I think most of what you said is damning. It's, it's really, um, you know, we're, we're really highlighting things that we know that often go un, unsaid. Um, and I think, yeah, the appropriation of the work needs to be underlined, highlighted, circled. Um, and the fact that the, the charter itself became appropriate 
interested is um yeah it's really it's really telling and it really reinforces uh why we're doing the work that we're doing and I guess for my next question I'd like to come back to Riddle because um like I said the conversations that we're having are really long overdue they're really honest and they're really exposing of the Vogue sector um really as the shambles that it is if we're being if we're being blunt um and I guess as a CEO of an organization that sits within the mainstream sector um what do you think the future looks like for the sector um and how can survivors navigate these services in the present um knowing that it might not always be safe for us to do so I mean, um, first of all, I just wanted to reflect on something that Huda said about white-led organizations. But now that I am in an organization that has been white for so long, I would say white majority organizations because um, there are many challenges for even as a as a leader, you know. And normally, when we are talking about this, we think about leadership. But as the leader uh, who is brown, the difficulty of of leading a team that is largely white and then implementing changes and practices that, uh, you know, um, that I learned uh, in, um, in, in, in Shakti Women's Aid, which was about, you know, not just going the extra mile, like walking a hundred miles along with survivors to get things done and to try and get them to think about that for all the women we are working with. Uh, even though it is not written down in an outcome. So simple things like, you know, um, I we have a kitchen, a functioning kitchen in our office. And, and of course, like it's been COVID, but, you know, the idea that uh, we could cook meals uh, together and maybe offer some to survivors. It's like I was asking them, I don't know, to climb a coconut tree and break down coconuts. You know, it's, it's, it was so difficult to even get them to acknowledge that maybe their CEO can cook food for them, let alone survivors. You know, things like that bring about that change um, is hard going. Um, and, and of course, there are questions asked of, of, of leadership if they are not the white, white cisgender woman uh, that you would never dream to ask a white cisgender woman uh, who is a leader by those who are. Um, by those who are, you know, uh, sort of quite distant from them in the organizational structure. Like if you make a decision, they'll ask you, like, are you qualified to make this decision? Or send an email across the whole organization uh, to ask you to not make that decision because that's not how things are, are done here. But thankfully that doesn't happen anymore because, um, you know, I, I know how to fight back. <laughs> Politely. Um, so, I mean, I think that's what I've learned from white women, passive aggressive uh, conversations. <laughs> um, but to answer your questions, uh, I think, like, I, so my world has become very small um, since I have this role, and, you know, and the sector I work in within Scotland, like the Red Crisis Movement within the Vox sector, um, I am filled with hope. Um, is what I want to say. I think uh, in the 16 years that I've 16 years that I've been in this movement in Scotland, at least what we where we've reached is is um, not so much leadership, but there is uh, an interesting workforce, mostly made up of new young feminist women who who maybe don't always get it right in terms of intersectional practice and so on, but they're definitely very keen to hold us accountable on intersectional thinking. And so that fills me with a little bit of hope. However, for survivors at the moment, it is dire. Um, so even, you know, just reflecting on Huda who's talking about um, the project, so, so as I said earlier, like we do have a project uh, that was set up for um, for BME women. That's the term that was used. But the way it was set up was actually it was not about appropriation. There was a genuine gap in terms of sexual violence services for for women of color in the city, and 
both the the organizations, the women's organizations were, that are by and for were not didn't have capacity, were not able to address. So there was like they were involved in the design of that service. And so it felt comfortable and it feels comfortable to have this service here within our organization. But it was interesting, just reflecting in the last few weeks, we've, we've received some tampon tax funding um, to run a first language support, uh, which will run uh, based within Edinburgh Prices, but will operate in two other centers as well, because they would never, and there isn't um, the population yet of, of women who would organize to set up a service, a box service by and for service. So to address those needs because women are waiting on their waiting list and needing sort of Urdu or Arabic or Polish or Chinese, um, Cantonese support. So we got this time on tax funding, but we, we are in, in that now about, it's about four or five months and I'm already thinking about legacy and worried about like what happens when I leave something that I alluded to earlier. And so what I've begun to say to my, my partner colleagues is that if we want this work to continue, we have to spin this project into a charity of its own, um, but in a way that it benefits from what Huda said, the, you know, like the bigger budgets of the white charities that, that we are part of, significantly bigger. Um, and, and so that the operations can thrive independently and the structures are not going to be influenced by uh, changing leadership. Because a lot of the sector and the work that's happening in this movement is down to leadership and their motivations uh, on inclusion. And often intersectionality I find has come to mean white women with other protected characteristics, um, which in some ways is, is great, but it's also easy to do. Um, sorry, <laughs> someone is tired, but uh, I think, for for women of color in Scotland, the issue, the situation is dire. The more rural and the more small town you are, the less likely you are going to get the safety and support that you need. Um, there will be prejudicial questions asked of you at intake. Like already, we are in a patriarchal system, particularly for domestic abuse services, where you can't even have a conversation with a brown woman or a black woman or anyone who appears to be an immigrant, uh, even though they may not be, whether the first question is like, are you entitled to benefits? Like no one gets asked that, but we are still asking that. And the othering starts from your very first interaction, no matter what the service is, whether it's a buy and for or a white service. So I think it feels, I like to be hopeful. The reality is that it is dire, but for, uh, for me to be convinced that my hope is justified, there has to be systemic change. Um, and in Scotland, we have an, like in, the funding scenario is, is currently under review, so we get most of us get a significant amount of funding from the Scottish government, and not so much, at least in the reprisals movement, not so much through tendering and so on. But we simply don't have any sexual violence services uh, for women of of color. Um, but we are in the middle of a, or the beginning stages of a national review on how funding is done, and I would be very interested to see in the outcomes of that if any special provisions are made. For, for minority ethnic women. I mean, they have the opportunity because they're starting something new, but will they take that is the question. I hope I've answered some of it. Absolutely. And I think um, the focus on hope and the, the fight for hope is really key. Um, for me and my kind of learning and leaning into abolition, um, hope and imagination are uh, foundational. And one thing um, I've been really interested in reflecting on is how the Vogue sector steals and stifles that hope and imagination because we're all burnt out and we're all, you know, getting up and slogging on and working within our trauma and being oppressed as workers from within. Um, and it's a really interesting reflection to have that actually um, 
it's hard to hope and imagine for that change whilst you're working within um, an oppressive system. Um, which brings me really nicely onto my uh, first question for Avia, um, because Avia's work is so deeply rooted in abolition practice. Um, and um, I wonder if we could explore this a bit deeper, because um, it has to be said that um, the Vogue sector is so deeply connected with systems of policing, criminal justice and carceral punishment. Um, so we can't really talk about the abolition of one without seriously talking about the abolition of the other. Um, so I wonder, Avia, if you could introduce us to an abolitionist understanding of Vogue, um, and if you'd have any advice for survivors like myself and practitioners um, like myself who um, are really trying to reconcile our activism with our experiences, our traumas, um, our righteous anger, um, and yeah, what your advice would be to those of us who are struggling to imagine and hope for that society where justice is transformative. Lots of questions, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. I will, I will, I will start off with abolition in the rural sector. And then if I, um, if I forget, I might ask you to, to remind me of the other, other that's points. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think that. At the, as it stands at the moment, you're absolutely right. The morgue sector is is like very much integrated with the state structures. And so it's really hard to imagine sort of abolitionist feminism or like how you survive abuse and violence outside of that. I'm gonna move away from these guys who are really loud. <laughs> um, but, I think it hasn't always been that way. And there are really important reasons as to how we got to where we are now. So when the sort of domestic violence, well, it wasn't a sector to begin with, it was a, it was like a sort of network of, of, of support. Um, often, you know, local women and feminists basically just like broke into squats in the seventies and decided you know, like that they'd had enough, that they wanted to create s support for themselves outside of um, men's control, um, you know? And up until that point, the role that capitalism had for them was to sort of be wives and mothers in the home. And, you know, they were kept there through violence and the state sanctioned that violence. The state basically gave men the authority to beat and rape their wives into submission and that was acceptable um and so when 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 a lot of women like broke into these squats and they set up alternative places to be that were safe they understood that the police and the state were were very much part of their oppression it was kind of the root of their oppression actually you know their their, their husbands would go out to go out and would get you know often into situations with the police especially if they were black um and then and then you know the, the state gave them the authority to 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 meet out that kind of abuse on on their on their partners and so when they were envisaging something new a lot of the people that that set those things up they saw that as outside of the state um and they really wanted to build something new build something that was self-sufficient um, for women to be able to support themselves outside of the things that oppressed them. And so the way in which those spaces were run was really different. It wasn't like, you know, they normally would have at home, like someone telling them what to do. Things were decided collectively. People used mutual aid. So like if one woman had already been to the housing a few weeks before another, she would go and support the, the new woman, things like that so that it was everyone's collective responsibility, no one was in charge of anyone else. And so like they, what they were trying to do was they were trying to envisage what would life be like if we didn't have someone running our lives, telling us what to do, beating us, controlling us. And that's, that's kind of what they came up with. Now, unfortunately, for a number of different reasons, um, you know, economic instability, 
and and you know the the difficulties of running that that those kinds of spaces within a capitalist system you know it's very hard it's very hard to run things like that within a capitalist system sustainably and so eventually you know they they'd set something up that was saving women's lives that was saving people's lives and so they were kind of hit with this like problem of all right well what do we do now do we you know try and get money funding to to keep it going or you know do we face possibly closing um and in this country anyway because we had a welfare state they they decided to to, to go with the state funding and that's kind of the situation that we we're in now is that you know a lot of the domestic violence sector especially the the much bigger charities are are kind of a a a part of the state um and the especially the the mainstream ones you know they've got into a situation year after year decade after decade where they will do anything to maintain that funding stream you know even if it means working with the police and the home office at the expense and the safety of black women of um you know women who have got insecure immigration status because if you know if the home office is offering them a million quid the home office is offering them a million quid and that's one of the one of the things that i most you know when i first like encountered sister space um one of the things that i was like most inspired by was that they're one of the few spaces like in this in the sector if you can even call them that i don't even really consider them part of the sector because it's so different that would not bend over backwards just to get the funding that would not basically sacrifice the most vulnerable people they support in order to get a bit of money here or get a bit get a bit of money there you know they would stand up to the state and obviously they were massively punished for it but they were prepared to take that risk um so you know in terms of understanding that in terms of abolition i think it's really really important to understand that we we like organize in a long tradition of people that have been imagining what world what a world would look like outside of interpersonal violence but also outside of the the, the police um the police systems that also like maintain our oppression um and there are there are groups there are collectives and there are spaces and services that are still doing that um so i guess like you know kind of getting more into the specifics of abolition and where that fits into it um i think you know a lot of um you know a lot of those the, the domestic violence services that i was talking about or the first spaces you know here in britain were, had that kind of understanding of the police they didn't want to work with the police they saw them as the oppressor um so there's always been that history i guess most recently sort of abolitionist feminism has come from a lot of black feminists in the us as well or like the most recent kind of like iteration of black feminism has come from um abolitionist feminism has come from black feminists in the us i'm thinking of people like angela davis like ruth wilson gilmore um and their their kind of understanding of these things is that you know over the last sort of 30 or 40 years what we've seen is 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 a deepening deepening crisis of criminalization of working class uh communities and particularly working class communities of color particularly black com communities and white feminist um you know um, what what they call what carceral feminist like sort of mainstream domestic violence and 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 vulgar or whatever you want to call it they've really argued for more more pre prisons more police um longer prison sentences to deal with the issue of domestic and sexual violence and for sort of 30 or 40 years they've worked very closely with the state to make that argument and what that's ended up what's ended up happening there is you know that hasn't that hasn't you know been felt by all perpetrators it's been felt by the poorest perpetrators it's been felt by perpetrators in the in the black um minority community but 
white and middle class perpetrators, they're never going to be touched by that. And what we've also seen is it's massively criminalized survivors. So the police often don't really care who the perpetrator is. They don't, you know, the, when the police come to a domestic violence incident, they're very often not thinking about feminist ideas, about liberation from patriarchy. They're just thinking, this is just an incident. I want it, I want to, I want to get this done as quickly as possible. Um, and you know, I worked for as an editor for years. It was very, 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 very common. You know, things like a, a survivor defending herself against a perpetrator. And particularly if she was black, that would be considered violence. You know, if he had scratch marks or something or marks on him that were defense marks, that would very often be considered aggression, especially if she was black, especially if she was a migrant. Um, and especially if she, you know, didn't know how to navigate the criminal justice system as well as, as, as the perpetrator did, he could manipulate it. And so what we've seen is, you know, these mainstream domestic violence services who have invested very heavily and have worked very closely with the state, arguing, um, arguing for more police, more prisons, you know, it's, it's really focused on, um, uh, it's really heavily focused on, sorry, <laughs> some people going past, um, on communities of colour, working class communities. And it's also deeply impacting survivors. We've seen a, a massive, massive increase in the criminalization of survivors. And so it's out of that context that sort of abolitionist feminism was saying, hold on a minute, this is not working. We've got to find another way. We've got to, we've got to figure out a way to um, address harm in, in our communities. And it's not about, you know, it's not about that thing of like, oh, don't, you know, don't snitch on a brother, da, 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 da. It's not about that. It's about, we have to find ways to address the real harm in our communities without perpetuating it by relying on prisons and police that are, are simply harming us further and deepening our criminalization and deepening survivors' criminalization as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's that bit. What's the what's the go on? Remind me what the next bit was. Um, the next bit was advice for those of us who are kind of navigating um, both either accessing support in these services or working within these services. It's also, um, yeah, navigating the want for abolition. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I say, you know, in Sisters Uncut, so most of the people in Sisters Uncut are survivors of domestic or sexual violence. Um, and we decided, we didn't start off um, abolitionist. We started off in 2014. We were trying to stop cuts to domestic violence services only. And, you know, through the story I just told you and through like struggle, through, you know, we kind of like developed our understanding and expanded it a bit and got, and it, it became more complex. Um, and, and richer, I would say. And so, you know, we, we kind of felt like there wasn't any way to um, address or, or kind of end violence against women without ending state violence and understanding the connections between the two, you know? Um, and so, you know, we didn't start off that way, but eventually we came to, to a decision that we, you know, a proposal was put forward to become an abolitionist collective. And that was a really difficult, that was a really difficult sort of conversation because there were, there were some survivors who couldn't really imagine safety without the criminal justice system. And then at the same time, there were other survivors who couldn't imagine safety with the criminal justice system. And so that was really, you know, a delicate, a delicate sort of conversation to, to be had. Um, so, you know, for anyone who is a survivor that is thinking about that, I really want to emphasize that, you know, there's, there's no, how you're feeling and how you're responding to it. That's not something that you need to feel bad or guilty about, or like you're, you're, you know, feeling scared or feeling vulnerable and feeling worried. And sometimes feeling like you do need to call 999. That's not something any survivor needs to feel guilty about. Um, and what we're trying to do is 
you know, hold that, hold that feeling collectively. So it's not an individual thing. It's about all of us, you know, we have to build up our capacity to support each other outside of the system that's harming us. It's not about you as an individual having to make these decisions all by yourself. It's like we have to build up our community system so that when, you know, my neighbor needs support, who's gonna go and support her when she's when she's in when she's in need? Who's gonna find her housing locally or or further away? It's about building that up so that we're collectively holding it and it's not about an individual feeling like I'm I'm a bad person because I needed to you know those systems weren't there and I needed support so I want to I really want to reassure and emphasize the importance of that um and kind of say you know we're yeah it's like it's it's a long process it's not going to be overnight um we're making strides um and yeah and just you know that hopefully the more we build up the collective, the more collect the collective can hold can hold those things for survivors. Thank you so much. And um, I think key to everything you've said there is that idea of collectivity, a move away from individualization, um, a move towards community, and ultimately what that means is coalition building, essentially. And I know that both yourself and Rose won't mind me saying that um, there's been a coming together of both Sister Space and Sisters Uncut to explore the differences between movements, um, namely um, the differences between the ideas of reform and abolition. Um, and you know, you've spoken so highly about uh, Sister Space and the work they do and the approach to the work they do. Um, so. I was wondering in the um, in the spirit of transparency and um, and an emphasis on coalition, um, what has been both of yours experiences um, and learning from this coming together? Um, and what do you think the wider org sector could learn from the ways that by and for communities do come together to work in coalition? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. I guess it's a question for, for both. Sophia and Rose. Sisters Uncut, when we were when we were in um in in problems with, with Hackney Council, Sisters Uncut unapologetically came to our aid. A set of young people, different races, different backgrounds. And they came and they helped us. They are one of the very, you know, many people who came and helped us to be where we are today. And it, all that was based on trust. It was based on injustice. It was based on the right thing being done by the people who are supposed to be in charge, who's supposed to be looking out for the women who are going through different kinds of abuses, who come to your services, who I presume you get money for from central government or wherever you do. And we, we, all, we all knew that there was the, the best way to do anything is at, at stages to get together and work together and root for what you believe in. And sometimes it's not just about sitting at the table and keep begging these people. Yeah, we like, as, as everybody knows, you do it the right way. You're nice, you're polite, you, you know, you go through it and then you find that there are all the different um, organization, especially the grassroots um, domestic abuse services, you all do the right thing, but there comes a stage. There's two things you have to do. One is to do collective work. It don't mean to say that you take away, that the other group takes away your voice or what you do. And two, you have to speak up. 
you've got nothing to lose. You've got everything to gain by speaking up. And I think um, with us and Sisters Uncut, um, it, we, we complemented each other because there was, um, as I said, like me and Ngozi who were the little bit more mature people. And then you had the young people who came with, with another way to do it. And we, we learned a lot from each other. And so listening to all, you know, to everyone on the panel here, amazing, just blew my mind because there's a lot that I don't have to say because you all have said it already. It is, it, it, it is what it is. Um, your second part of the question, I did write it down, but I can't even remember it now. Your second part, you said. Well, it was a, it was a question for both of you and one on, yeah, kind of what, what do you think the, the wider violence against women and girls sector can learn from the ways that um, I am for grassroots communities like yourselves come together to learn together and grow together and work alongside each other. So what the wider work sector can do is first be honest, right? And like all the speakers have said, we know how uh, the, the mainstream, the main um, 10 or so organizations, uh, domestic abuse organizations, they just have to be honest and come clean listen to what we have to say, listen to what the uh, survivors, because it's the survivors that keep us all in, in, in the roles that we're in. It's the survivors who help to affect change. And so the wider voir sector, when we as sister space uh, talk about um, black women experiences, we don't want to go, we more or less go through what the survivors go through. So the survivors have to keep um, explaining themselves over and over and over again to, to how many people. And then they have to then break down what they mean to the Vogue sector. Um, so you're asked a question and then you're asked something else that has, that you have to explain to um, an IDVA that really should know some of the things that the people, you know, that the women are saying. So black women, they're, ju they're just tired. They're just tired of it. If a black woman tells you, look, I've been through this and I know that part of this thing is you're stereotyping me, there's racism involved, there's um, discrimination involved and you will turn around and tell them, no, it's not. But, you know, you, 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 can, you can count the amount of um, you can count the amount of ways that the Vuag sector are not in tune with what's happening. I must say though that there's a few of them that are really taking it on board now and actually looking to make change. They're looking to want to work with you. A lot of them still want to be your partner and you're just like, nah, we're not doing that, but we can work with you. Let us sit down, let us have these conversations, invite us to the table, let us talk about it. Um, you, you know, you can even uh, kind of say, well, these are the things that are going on. These are the people that you can talk to, you know, like open up, open up the way, because we're not a threat to you, because you all are the ones that got all the money. You all, the, you all are the ones that know you know, that, that uh, uh, go to all the meetings in central government. You all are the ones that do the training and so on and so forth. And so by, don't just come and get us when you need to do your tick boxes. This is one of these other thing. You will come to a black group, a Muslim group or some other group when you wanna tick boxes. Do that long before, but it's essential that we all sit down at the table. It is essential that we are allowed to tell our truths. It is essential that you will listen to the truth. And it's essential that if even if you don't like what you hear, that you acknowledge what you hear, sit down, keep quiet, listen to it, let's have a conversation. But also it's essential that you listen to the women. So we will bring you or tell you the, the the women's experiences and based off of that 
you can then um, open up the floor. You can then open up the way to make changes because that is what's needed to make changes. Huda said um, something so important and we get this at Sister Space all the time from some uh, the Voag sector. People have the cheek to ask us, are we professionals? They ask you things like that. When you challenge them on the way that they think that you should work, and this is the way that mainstream work, as soon as you do something different, they're like, um, are you qualified? Are you qualified to know that? No, this is how it goes. No, this is how, and we're saying no, but this is how we work. This is how we do it, yeah? And this is, we work for the women and we take instruction from the women for the, what they want. Now we talk about um, partnerships and working together, but it, you have to have that same thing as well with the women that you work with. It is like a partnership with the women that you work with. And it, so it should be with the Boag sector also. And um, my, my other point is, in fact, let me just quickly, other point is, um, we, um, there, for us in the black community, in the, yeah, my mum and them who, who are all in their eighties and coming up to their nineties, never had the chance or the experience to use the Vogue sector when and if they went through domestic abuse, never. They didn't have nowhere to go. Nobody would offer them places to go. It didn't matter whether or not they were gonna take it, but you can imagine now with this whole Windrush thing, because they're off the Windrush generation, they never ever um, had the chance to experience any of the, the Boag sector. And even now, nobody talks about them. So this is why specialist organizations are uh, essential. This is why it's, it's essential for there to be, because um, the, the question is about partnership, isn't it? And this is why it's essential for us to all sit down so we can say to them, this is what's happened. This is what you can never be able to deal with. This is what we can do. This is what this or other organization can do and then sit down. But it's honesty, it's been uh, sitting at the table. It's not talking um, about us and it's not talking to us. And it's about um, letting people um, have a voice and say and speak their truth. Yeah, I had more, but I can't even think. I'm just like, ah. And oh, <laughs> and this, this, and, and Avias, um, somebody said uh, again about the new young feminists that are coming through. Um, there, there is a big issue, like um, that I'm saying, there is a big issue with a lot of the young people that are coming through. Um, they have, uh, they have their views and they've got their ways of, um, of doing what they're doing, but a lot of them are willing to listen. A lot of them are, uh, are looking to join together and to have conversations and to talk about things as well. And that is very, very refreshing as well. And we just got too many people who like to talk. Yeah, a lot of these organizations just, just like to talk, 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 talk. And um, you, you just wait so long for something to happen, for something different to happen. So we need movement, we need things to happen, and we need it to happen much, much quicker um, than it is, because lives are still being lost. You're so right, Rose. Thank you. And yeah, I guess, Avia, do you have anything to add in addition to that on the, on the concept of coalition building? Definitely. Um, yeah, I, you know, personally, I'd say I've learned a lot from sister space um they yeah like but well first of all like initially you know having like gone through like the domestic violence sector myself as a survivor and then as a worker I'd never like been exposed to a space like sister space that really like has a completely different take on what it means to to create safety for survivors like a completely different approach like it's it's comforting and comfortable and it's like informal and it's not like like sterile service provision that's just like 
you know, jagged and like, you can't, you've got all these boundaries and it's, you, you know, you can't say this, you can't say that, da, 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 da. there's none of that. Um, and I didn't really know that you could still have that. Um, and yeah, like I would say that, you know, one of the things that's quite interesting and like Rose touched on this is the kind of like, you know, generational difference between a lot of people in Sisters Uncut are like mostly younger and the people, you know, running Sister Space um, are, are, are older. And in a lot of ways that, yeah, like Rose is right, that really complemented e like each other in terms of, you know, we've had a lot to learn from Sister Space and being able to like, how, how do you build up that kind of, you know, they've got so much experience and knowledge going, going back years and years and years and understand how you build up that kind of community support. Um, and, we, and we kind of came at it with ideas. We've got all these ideas, like all this idealism um, which like a lot of young people have, right? Um, one of the things we weren't always so good at and that hopefully we're getting better at is how you take your idealism and all of your ideas and your political ideas and then also work with people and like meet people where they're at, meet community groups where they're at and negotiate it and figure it out together. That was the bit that we probably found harder to do, to know like, well, if we believe this, then, you know, where does, where do, where does it sit if we're working with a group that doesn't have exactly the same ideas and strategies? Um, and that's something that I think, yeah, Sister Space, like their like wisdom and experience kind of like has shown us the way around I think uh, you know I think a, a lot of older people who've, who've been around like a lot longer are better at having the difficult conversations I think especially in in a lot of movements like you know I think there's a lot of disposability that happens in like younger people's movements that once your politics doesn't match mine you did it and then that's it. And you don't do the hard work. We're not very, we're not very as well versed at doing the hard work, but sister space are, and they've had to be. And like, I, th I find that, you know, when I speak to a lot of people that have been organizing for, for many, many years, they're much better at that kind of thing, knowing how to build coalition, how to work together, how to identify the things that you have common ground on and how you're gonna get through the difficulties, the differences um so yeah and you know and um, yeah we've we've chatted to we've chatted to sister space about you know our ideas about abolition and and what what kind of world do you want to see and what 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 motivates us and what makes us passionate um and yeah and like i don't know i feel like i've learned a massive amount from sister space like um in that respect and continue to continue to learn from them um and I think the, the, the importance around coalition building, it's not, it's not a romantic thing, it's a difficult thing and it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of emotional labor. It takes a lot of like going back after you've, you know, after you've had difficult or awkward conversations, like mustering up the courage to go back and, and, and go again, because that's, that's what builds trust. That's what builds re resilience. Like, and if you can find it within yourself to do that, you know, when you've like maybe had, you know, I've been like in long drawn out meetings with different groups of people and you think, oh, I never really want to go back to that. If you can find it within yourself to do that. That's where you, you, your strength lies. And I think, you know, personally, I think a lot of, in my experience, like organizing over the last few years, a lot of younger people have maybe lost touch with that, like that, those skills over like, over the years and I think people are now becoming much more interested in building that up again and I think elders like people in sister space lots of other and lots of other groups are going to be absolutely key to building that building up that skill base again so that we know how to build coalition work together that's because that's going to be our key strength so yeah thank you both so much um for that I I think the intergenerational learning 
is key um, and was a real key takeaway for me. And also something that sprung to mind was how the responsibility of holding those spaces can't solely be on us as the buy-in for organisations because um, when we're returning to those spaces that have caused us harm, I'm thinking of myself in particular, um, we need to know those spaces are safe and that's that's really um, important for the white-led organisations to, um, to be working on that to ensure that when we come into coalition building spaces that, that we're not harmed further. Um, so I'm conscious of the time and I've got one last question for Huda before we move on to the Q&A. Um, and I know we've been chatting behind the scenes about uh, whether or not to ask this, but I thought, yes, let's let's go for it. And um, maybe a, a quick answer if possible, and then we can move on to the Q&A. Um, for those of you in the audience who have questions, feel free to start popping them in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and for now, my, my final question, Huda, is um, in relation to, I suppose, workers like ourselves, and we've talked about how survivors um, accessing support experience harm and um, how the system harms us. Um, and today there's been a lot of talk about those negatives. But for me, the Charter and the Feministo are undoubtedly rooted in a practice of change. Um, and I've attended almost all of the workshops and seminars led by the Anti-Racism Working Group. Um, and as a Black practitioner, there's a real sense of validation and determination and optimism that underpins all of this. Um, so my last question is, what advice would you give to Black and minoritized practitioners like ourselves um, who are working in the sector, be that white-led organizations or within buying for organizations within such a white dominated sector, who may be struggling to reconcile their own traumas, their activism and their practice um, all at the same time? It's a big question to end on. I'm sorry. I'm going to try and be brief, but I think it's really relevant. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Being doing this work is um, kind of paying the rent for being on this planet. I guess. I think what's really uh, um, what's really clear is um, th this is toxic material that we deal with, whether it's the harm of patriarchy or the harm of racism or classism or any other harms. And I think one of the many things that I have um, really struggled with is that boundary between the personal and the political because you know my 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 uh, my reason for being in that space is the personal and it drives my political um, and uh, for me this is as I call it sacred activism this is not a job for all of us, it's the same. It's not. It's not like we're well paid or, or have great benefits to this work, in terms of like you know um, holidays or any other kind of HRE type things. We are in this work because we we want to bring about um, a just society that values people and puts human beings at the forefront, not systems or you know a, a, an elite of people. Um, so taking care of ourselves is really paramount. And sometimes um, through, uh, it's, it's, I haven't figured this out, it's still a journey, but in my journey, um, sometimes I would, I, I would inverse the, the personal and political and say, you resting is political. You need to do it because white supremacy wants you to burn out. White supremacy wants you to stop. And so it is designing these kind of obstacles so that you continue to hit a brick wall and eventually break. And so knowing that um, rest is as important as the labor is really, really uh, central to my, um, my practice. Um, being surrounded by my tribe is absolutely, you know, life-saving. It, it, and it doesn't need to be, you know, it's a diverse group of women who come from all walks of life and who are, you know, who are white, black, green, yellow, whatever. 
uh, and it, it it matters deeply that there is someone uh, there is a sanctuary for my emotions to go to um, and for my mind and politics to rant about um, and then also knowing that um, there is a, a really great quote in, in one of the uh, Jewish um, texts that I came across when working with the um, Faith and Vogue Coalition, particularly, which um, Jewish women's aid uh, Naomi passed on to me. And she said, there, one, one philosopher says, you do not have to fix the world and you do not have to end the work. You don't have to see it through, but you must not uh, give up on it so you must continue the work um, and so I think that's something that I've come to really try and um, remember I don't need to be in every space fighting every fight I don't even have to be fighting all the time and finding joy is the biggest kind of sort of two fingers up to the man um, as possible um, as and as important as as kind of being on demonstrations, being in home, home office spaces, being in violent spaces, being in women's white led spaces. And I totally kind of understand increasingly that, you know, and part of the way that we are breaking barriers is that uh, black and minoritized women uh, like uh, Riddle is taking, uh, like taking space and making things happen in white only spaces. And it must be extremely, you know, uh, taxing uh, to say the least to be leading a, a white majority organization and be responsible and accountable yet powerful but not powerful and all in different spaces at all times and we all do that in in different spaces so i think for black and minoritized women in white spaces please do seek out the um, anti-racism working group uh, black women's only gatherings um, and do contact us if you feel like you would like to contribute to um, a discussion or you would like to um, suggest a topic to talk about and also forming uh, kind of black led groups is also important in, in the uh, organizations that you work in and know that your job is not to educate white people they've got google for that or books now if they want um, which is the great direct jones told me um, formerly of imkan she said your responsibility is not to teach white people tell them to go google it um, and so i remember that too uh, and i really uh, hear what avia says uh, as well as um, what rose says you know the intergenerational um, experience is so important our living ancestors and past ancestors are amazing places of support and sanctuary and wisdom. And in our brashness and in our, like, you know, um, egotism, we forget that. We think we're the ones that are fighting this new fight and it's never been like this before and it's more terrible than ever. You know, women on this panel have done this for a long, longer than me and they know their stuff. And so seeking them as models of, kind of um, practice uh, uh, and, and thought and politics and strategy, but as also celebrating them and knowing like, look at these trailblazers in this room, they're absolutely phenomenal. And you know, they have, we stand on your shoulders. And so we, we know that if, if we have you um, in, in our hearts and in our minds, then we can, we can only, we can only Grow, uh, grow from the seeds that you have sown. So gratitude to all of you for all you do. And may we continue to fight white supremacy and, and patriarchy and all the classisms in the world because um, they are not made for us and it's a distraction. So enjoy life and be joyous. Um, that's your job. And I'm so glad that we didn't put that last question out because wow, what an answer. Um, I mean, I've been making notes. I put intergenerational learning, rest as resistance, with, which as we know, is kind of the cornerstone of black feminism. Community, black led and by and for community. Uh, I put a sanctuary for my emotions, which was a direct quote from you and I love that. Um, so yes, thank you, Huda. Um, I'm conscious we've got 15 minutes left. Um, so hopefully we've got time for one or two uh, questions. 
Um, we've got a couple in the Q&A box. Um, and we've got one big one that I'd like to end on and one more practical one I think I'd like to go for. So one says, would you consider unionising as a form of abolition? And if so, what advice would you give for board practitioners thinking of doing so? Um, I'm going to pose that to the room. Anyone feel free to, to jump on that if you have any thoughts. Sorry, say the question again. Bear with me, let, it, let me get it back up. So would you consider unionising as a form of abolition? Um, and I guess we could go more broadly as a form of racial justice work. Um, and if so, what advice would you give for Vogue practitioners thinking of doing so? I know for me that really springs to mind the um, case study, well, the case of um, the um, Solace Women's Aid, which last year unionised um, against their employers um, as a collective of black and brown practitioners. Um, and they demanded that their, um, that their CEO, their board, I want to say their HR team and upper management, um, all stepped down due to the racism that was perpetrated from the top down and they were successful in um, having those demands met. Um, so that uh, is my initial thinking on that topic. Um, and I know Avia's disappeared somewhere, <laughs> um, probably to go fight battle on the front lines. Um, but yeah. But if one, of, one of the things that, that needs, to be, uh, needs to be done, sometimes you're in these meetings and you think you're back in the 1960s, 1970s, because there's one black person on, on, on the panel. Then, you know, there might not be any other person of, of uh, as they call them, people of color, uh, no, nobody from a different religion or different background. The, the CEO upwards all the way down is white and nobody sees that there's a problem with it. Nobody kind of even sees that's why you're still um, fighting the same fight, which that should have, you know, that you should have gone way clear past that a long time ago. And so all the services need to really look at from the top down to make sure that you just don't have the token black person. Because even in these meetings, when you're sitting there and you, you see the token black person, there's some, most of them are going through hell and high water because they're the ones that have to um, be the spokesperson for everything black. And a lot of people may not think that all these things happen, but they happen all the time. It still happens. So every VOG sector, your, your, your board, your chairperson, your this, your that, whatever all these titles these people have, you need to have more people, more, um, a better representation of um, of people, um, even in terms of um, IDVAs. Most of the most of the um, VOG sector do not have a, a nice cross section of um, of IDVAs working for them. Um, so, in terms of just being true and honest and reflecting the population. That's the first thing that all of them got to do. If we're, we're doing about Valerie's law and the training, one of the things that you need, you need to train the people up at the top. The people up at the top never want to do no training. Yeah, but you're getting paid by, by Mopac or whomever it is that you're thinking. And so it's always the, the people down that's doing all the work are the ones that's taking the flack because decisions are made from the top. And a lot of them have to do as they're told from the top. And if the top are racist and they're prejudiced and they're very discriminatory and a lot of them don't even like women, yeah, because, um, because of the way that they, um, you know, what their policies are like, then there is, a, there is a huge problem. And if we're saying to you all, come now management, come on and do some training. 
don't take offense and think that we're just, um, you know, being boasty, as we call it, boasty. We're not being boasty. We're just saying you all need to come down um, and, and learn something new so that you can have better staff, you can have a better service and um, what is it better? Oh, uh, is it best practice that they call it? They call it best practice, but no, no best practice can happen if people from the top think they're too nice to come down and learn, yeah? All of us here are still learning. All of us here still go on training courses. All of us here still come on panels and talk and try to, you know, and try to make things happen, yeah? We don't get as much money as you all, but we realize and recognize that for the people that we're working for, they need to know that we're still very functional. And that's the bit about them people up at the top. Thank you so much, Rose. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on this one um, in terms of unionizing? Or are we happy for me to ask one final question from the uh, audience? Yeah, you can do the next question. Oops, I better come off. Better. <laughs> okay, so, and I've just seen Huda has answered this in the, in the Q&A. Um, I wonder what other people's thoughts are because it's a biggie and we're gonna, we're gonna end with a bang. So the question is, given the flaws that you've listed, and we've listed a lot of flaws tonight, given the flaws that you've listed, um, do you think that um, the Vogue sector in its current state is reformable? Or is the apple too rotten and do we need to move away from it to a new model? Um, and I quite like um, the metaphor used, which we see so often used in regards to the police, um, the rotten apple. Um, but yeah, it's a big question. Is the Vogue sector in its current state reformable or is it too rotten and we need to move away to a new model? Hoda, I know you've answered in the in the chat. Do you want Can to? Can I just say very quickly, yeah, very quickly, it is reformable, but we have to hold them to account all the time. That's the solution. End of story. All this talk, 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 talk. Hold them to account and keep at them and it, it will be reformed. We're the best ones to reform them. That's it. Full stop. <laughs> Riddle, I see you've taken yourself yes, off. Um, yeah, I, I think it is reformable. Um, there's a, a real, like lots of, number of the speakers spoke about, just sort of, I think they need to move away from their trust in, in police and government in, in the way that they have, uh, in, you know, trusted or believed. I think trusted, even though they some of them might be cynical, there is this feminist patriarchy that exists within this this sector and the sort of comfort that comes with seniority that needs to not be so comfortable. So it is it is transformable. Um, I I think I agree with Huda. The it's the workers that will keep the transformation going. Um, and it's for leaders to really, I know that we have hierarchies, but, but we can run our organization as collective uh, consultative spaces. And then we run it as that you will make good inclusive decisions, um, not always right the first time, but definitely you can, you can get there. It is absolutely possible. And, you know, people die. So uh, there, will be, there will be others uh, with youth and passion and joy who will come and make, make things better. Thank you so much, Bridal. And for anyone who hasn't seen Huda's comment underneath that question, Huda put, there's definitely room for transformation. We just need people to keep the pressure on the leadership to carry on doing the work. Workers have been very clear in pushing their managers to carry on the work. It's all our job to keep pushing. So, whew, what a what a note to end on. I don't think I could say anything to top that. Um, I'm conscious we've got four minutes left. So on that note, I think we'll leave it there um, with a hell of a lot of food for thought to go away with. Um, and 
On behalf of myself and Festival of Debate, I want to give a huge never-ending thank you to our panellists for not only taking the time to share this space and their expertise with us tonight, but for all the work that you're all doing to forward the movement day by day. Um, and I also want to thank Festival of Debate for hosting this space um, and for working with me to ensure that the night remains safe for all of us here today. Um, so a huge, huge thank you to everyone involved. Um, and I hope everyone has a lovely night and um, forwards the movement one by one. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Evie, you've been amazing. Can I say a big thank you to Evie as well for curating uh, tonight's event and, and holding the space so well and, and sharing tonight's discussion. So thank you very much, Evie. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Take care. Good night. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>